That was footage of John Lennon recording his 1971 diss track, How Do You Sleep, directed at Paul McCartney during the peak of their feud. Now, the swear word didn't make it into the final song, but you can tell by this footage the genuine hostility that Lennon had towards McCartney at this time. It's fair to say that Lennon and McCartney's relationship was a complicated one, but how did they go from writing like brothers in the Beatles to John Lennon calling Paul McCartney a... C word. Hi, I'm Adam. Welcome back to Music Mongoose. 1957. A 16 year old John Lennon was lead singer in the group The Quarrymen, named after the Quarry Bank High School in Liverpool, where Lennon and his bandmates went to school. They were predominantly a skiffle band, very different to what the Beatles would later become. Skiffle was more of a folky blues genre that came about pre rock and roll. In July of that year, Lennon's band had a gig at a local festival on the outskirts of Liverpool, sharing the lineup with a dog show. Very prestigious. More importantly, though, was who happened to be in the audience, a 15-year-old Paul McCartney. McCartney, impressed with what he saw and keen to show off his own talent, quickly introduced himself to the band, impressing them with an array of rock and roll tunes he played on his guitar. Soon, McCartney joined the group and also encouraged the signing of another local talented musician, George Harrison. This was the beginning of what would become one of the most important writing partnerships of all time. And just over a year later, Lennon and McCartney found something in common, something a bit sad. In July 1958, a year after the pair met, John Lennon's mother, Julia, sadly passed away. She died in a car accident. Lennon didn't live with his mum, but he absolutely adored her. She was the one who introduced Lennon to rock and roll, taught him his first guitar chords, bought him his first guitar. So her passing away understandably affected Lennon drastically. Paul McCartney had also lost his mother, Mary, when he was 14 years old. She had died of breast cancer. So despite being quite a sad thing to have in common, it did bring the two closer together. We had a kind of bond that we both knew about that. We knew that feeling, McCartney would later tell Rolling Stone. And both John and Paul's mothers would appear in later Beatles material. Lennon wrote the song Julia, addressing his sense of loss, while McCartney would write Let It Be, featuring the lyric Mother Mary. For years, fans interpreted Mother Mary as the Virgin Mary, mother of Jesus. In fact, McCartney was famously inspired to write Let It Be after seeing his mother in a dream. In this dream, she would give Paul some advice to the effect of everything will be alright, let it be. From here, Lennon and McCartney's bond grew stronger and stronger as they formed and succeeded with the Beatles. They would create the formidable writing partnership, Lennon-McCartney. And with that, any Beatles song written by either of the two was always credited as a Lennon-McCartney composition. This tradition was decided pretty early on in the Beatles' career and continued right until the end. Lennon once told journalist David Sheff, We always had that thing that our names would go on songs even if we didn't write them. It was never a legal deal between Paul and me, just an agreement to put both our names on our songs. Lennon also said that the Beatles song, Give Peace a Chance, was actually written by Lennon and Yoko Ono. But as with the tradition, the Lennon-McCartney credit was slapped on the record. An enduring reminder of their bond and mutual respect. And this writing partnership just continued to grow. In fact, Lennon told Playboy magazine in 1980 that him and McCartney would write eyeball to eyeball. They were an inseparable writing machine in the early years. Their friendship would continue to blossom in Hamburg. The Beatles, with their sudden rise in popularity, were gigging heavily. Brian Epstein, their manager, had booked them on some pretty hectic schedules. Some of these gigs involved staying around Hamburg's red light district. The members of the band indulged in some naughty, naughty debauchery, including women, drinks, and other stuff, and it all brought them closer together. McCartney once told GQ magazine, In music, it made us a very tight band, but as friends, it made us able to read each other when we were super close. Now, the Beatles weren't huge at this point. They didn't have the massive financial backing as they would in later years, so their sleeping arrangements was quite often bunk beds and single hotel rooms. Their schedule would force the band members to physically be close to each other, and as it turns out, it would work wonders for their chemistry both on and off the stage. 
Now, just quickly, before we go on, I just want to make a deal with you, a gentleman's agreement. If you learn anything new in this video, anything at all, no matter how big or small, you have to press subscribe, okay? If you're on a computer, just click subscribe below. If you're on the TV, you can pause the video, scroll up to the channel icon, and press subscribe there. Anything at all, gentleman's agreement. Let's continue. In 1962, the Lennon-McCartney partnership had its first breakthrough with the Beatles' debut single, Love Me Do. Then a few months later came Please Please Me, which went to number one and really kicked off the whole Beatlemania period. A period that would see the Beatles skyrocket in fame and success, conquer America and, not to put it too dramatically, change the history of rock and roll forever. And remember, though neither of them would want to admit it at the time, their secret rivalry, that urge to outdo the other one, was probably a big factor in their success. Were you guys competitive? Yeah, we were competitive, yeah. Not openly, but we, we later admitted, yeah, you know, so Paul's written a good one there, I better get going. And I would similarly, mm, that's a bit good, right. Here we go. When you get two incredibly creative and adept songwriters trying to outdo the other, the final product is going to be mind-blowing. So really, you could say this rivalry was crucial for the success of the Beatles. 1967 would be an important year for the Beatles. This would be the year that their rivalry, up until now bubbling under the surface, would reveal itself and burst to the forefront. It was the year that the partnership and the group would start to fall apart. While 1967 saw the release of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, their most iconic work according to some critics, it also saw the point when Lennon and McCartney would start to separate, interests and priorities would diverge, and the Lennon-McCartney power struggle, which would make the final years of the band difficult, started to emerge. Sgt. Pepper was, for all intents and purposes, a McCartney project. He had forced his way into a defining leadership role, and this didn't really sit well with Lennon. That's one of the main reasons the Beatles ended. We got fed up of, of being sidemen for Paul. By the late 60s, both Lennon and McCartney were producing probably some of their greatest works. However, their creative inspiration was deviating at the same time as their personal lives. Lennon was in the midst of an intense relationship with Yoko Ono and became increasingly absent from the group with a reported heroin addiction. Now, the events leading up to the Beatles' breakup is well documented all over the internet. Both George Harrison and Ringo Starr would leave and then later rejoin at different stages due to the building internal power struggles between all of the members. And when the news finally did break out that the Beatles had split up, McCartney received the brunt of the backlash. The media would brand him as the reason for the Beatles breaking up, despite John actually leaving before him. This turn of events upset John Lennon. The way Paul and the media were portraying the breakup made it seem like it was Paul's decision, that he was the leader of the Beatles and that his decision had ultimately broken them up. The way that the news was coming to light made it seem that McCartney was the leader of the band and that Lennon-McCartney partnership was just thrown out the window. Lennon even went to the press himself, declaring, I started the band, I disbanded it. It's as simple as that. This whole situation would cause a significant rift between the pair. Things got nasty. To be clear, in this period, the pair were far from the brotherly writing partnership like before. There was some genuine hatred here. You have to realise that power struggles in the band had been raging for years. There was now legal and financial pressures as well. Personal arguments were becoming professional arguments with the whole saga of Yoko Ono. And then the news of the breakup itself just piled on the hostility between the two. In 1970, John Lennon recorded a lengthy interview with Rolling Stone magazine. In it, he talks about the history of the Beatles in an incredibly scathing manner, referring to nearly the entirety of the catalogue as dishonest, bar a few of the songs he wrote himself. In terms of the Lennon-McCartney partnership, he labelled himself as the true artist, and McCartney a mere songsmith who's more focused on the commercial side of things. He said performing as a Beatle was torturous. I resent performing for f idiots who don't know anything. They can't feel. They live vicariously through me and other artists. He also famously called McCartney's debut album rubbish as well. 
Now, I can't list all the things that he says in this interview, otherwise this video would be hours long, but rest assured, what he does say is absolutely brutal. And McCartney was understandably hurt by these words. With this hostility, McCartney, always one to write about personal experiences, released his second album, Ram, in 1971. On the album was the track, Too Many People. While never explicitly said at the time, it's pretty clear that these lyrics were jabs at John and Yoko Ono. Paul was taking shots at the couple. In retaliation, Lennon released How Do You Sleep, which featured on his Imagine album. The lyrical content included, The only thing you done was yesterday, and since you've gone, you're just another day. And really weirdly in the song, Lennon acknowledges the bizarre, bonkers conspiracy theory that Paul McCartney is actually dead and was replaced by a body double in the 60s. Those freaks were right when they said you was dead. Later reflecting on the song, Lennon said to author David Sheff, I was using my resentment towards Paul to create a song. Let's put it that way. If you ever had any doubts that Lennon and McCartney once hated each other, well, there's the proof. Their relationship at this point was unfortunately tumultuous. However, they did seem to patch things up pretty quickly. In 1974, the bootleg album A Toot and a Snore was released. This is well known to be the last recordings where John and Paul appear together. The album wasn't a hit. In fact, Pitchfork called it atrocious. But more importantly, it was proof that Lennon and McCartney had reconciled and could be in the same room together and even make music together. In the mid-70s, Lennon revealed how the pair had made up. I haven't worked with Paul because we had a more difficult time, but now we're pretty close. In 1975, Lennon all but retired from music after the birth of his son, Sean. And in 1980, of course, he sadly lost his life in New York City, just after releasing his first album in five years. Now, rumours began circulating again that Paul and John had fallen out around this time because of Paul's reaction to Lennon's death. What time did you hear the news? This morning sometime. Very early? Yeah. Go on now, yeah? Drag, isn't it? Okay, cheers. Go on. Let's go. Hello, guys. Thank you. Go. However, later, Paul addressed the issue and said he was still processing the news, and I think you'd be a fool not to see that. I mean, I do the same thing. I take a long time to process bad news, and while I'm processing it, I want to do anything and say anything not to talk about the news. That is what Paul was going through there, I'm pretty sure. It's comforting to know, as a Beatles fan, and a fan of both McCartney and Lennon, that they were able to reconcile and become close again after this feud. Lennon was even on board for a Beatles reunion, if someone else organised it. Classic Lennon. Lennon invited Art Garfunkel and David Bowie back to his home after the Grammy Awards in 1975. He reportedly asked Art for advice about how to reunite with McCartney and the Beatles. Though of course it never came to fruition, it was clearly on his mind. And it goes to show that the Lennon-McCartney bond never fully went away. It just went into hiding for a bit. Later, McCartney wrote in his book, I was very glad of how we got along in those last few years that I had some really good times with him before he was murdered. Luckily, our last meeting was very friendly. We talked about how to bake bread. So a rivalry that first remained hidden, but eventually burst into the foreground and caused a massive rift between the two. But it would also be this rift that would ultimately cause both of them to realize how important their friendship was. Oh, it's like a Disney movie, isn't it? Lovely. Now, the breakup of the Beatles gave way for Led Zeppelin to rise up in the 70s and conquer the world with the famous, incredible vocals from Robert Plant. But did you know Robert Plant's life is littered with tragedies? Click here to watch that video next.